Well, if you've been around Karis City for a little while and you've gotten to know me a little bit, you know that this isn't my only job. Being your pastor is my passion, it's my ministry, but it's not actually the job that pays my family's bills. I've been an attorney for 28 years. And what I've learned from litigation over 28 years is that several people can experience the same thing and yet they see something different. So like if there's a car crash at an intersection and there are four independent witnesses that just happen to be there, you talk to them and they all saw something different. Now, they're not making that up. They're not lying. They've got no dog in the hunt, so to speak. They're just saying what they saw, but based on their perspective, they see something a little different. And if you're a parent, you know exactly how this works. You have two kids that argue, and if they're anything like my kids, it's always the other person's fault. And they're not lying. Well, I mean, sometimes they're lying. But often they're not lying. They just have a different view of what took place. Your perspective can influence what you see. Let me give you an example of that. This is a real easy illustration. Check out this shoe picture that went around the internet a few years ago. How many of you guys see gray and blue? How many of you see some pink? You folks are crazy. There is no pink in that picture. But the reality is we see different things even though we're looking at the exact same picture. All right, well, there was also a dress picture. You may remember this that went around a couple of years before that. So who sees blue and black? Who sees white and gold? You guys are not even Christian. (laughs) Who sees some different combination of colors? Yeah, this actual dress is blue and black, but most people see white and gold. And scientists have tried to explain how this happens, and really they haven't come up with a really good explanation other than it's influenced by our perspective. Our perspective can influence what we see. And our perspective, it's kind of the lens through which we view the world around us. Our perspective is made up of our personality, but it's also made up of the influences in our life, different things we've experienced, people that we listen to, things we believe impacts our perspective. And that perspective then affects what we see. Let me give you a couple of other examples of how this works. We can look at a headline and see the exact same headline and react completely different ways. For instance, if we see a particular candidate won an election, it's all the same words we see, but some people are all excited and thinking, man, our country is going to be awesome for the next four years, and other people are wondering if our country is even going to survive for the next four years. We're all seeing the, the exact same headline but we see it in different ways. Let me give you an even easier illustration. We go to ESPN and we see a score. (laughs) Eagles 21, Cowboys 20. I am despondent and in despair over that. There are people in Philadelphia that are excited about that. Our perspectives influence what we see. Our realities are as much about our perspective as they are about the actual facts we're experiencing. And when we understand this, it can help us allow God and Jesus to shape the way we view the world, to change our perspective on what we're seeing, and we react better to our circumstances. Well, if you have your Bibles, your Bible apps, go ahead and open those up to the Old Testament book of Numbers chapter 13. We're in the middle of our Wanderer sermon series where we're looking at different parts of Israel's journey from captivity in Egypt into the promised land. And so over the last three weeks, we've talked about how God parted the Red Sea so the Israelites could pass through and then he destroyed the Egyptian army. We've talked about how God fed the Israelites in the desert with manna from heaven. Then last week, uh, we had a a sermon, a great sermon. Man, if you missed it, our mission partner from Japan was here and Jay did a great job talking about when Moses went up to get the Ten Commandments from God, the Israelites actually made an idol of a calf and they worshiped that. So throughout this journey, They've had some ups and downs, it's fair to say. But at this point in the story, they are right at the edge of the promised land. They've set up camp there. Let's pick up the story in Numbers 13, 1 through 2. The Lord said to Moses, Send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites. From each ancestral tribe, send up one of its leaders. So God is saying, send some men to check out this new crib that I'm giving you. Notice that he says, I'm giving it to you. Now, for those of you that have been around church a while, you know this, that Canaan is also called what? 
the promised land, right? It's not called the possible land. It's not called the potential land. It's not even called the probably land. It's called the promised land because God is giving it to them. And, and so God says, send 12 dudes, check it out, and check out and see what I'm giving you. But notice that God doesn't say, send these 12 men in to kind of see whether we can potentially take over this land. He, he doesn't say, send these 12 guys in so we can come back and we can create some sort of probability chart. We can put all the positives on one side and all the negatives on the other side. We can make a decision. He doesn't say, I need some additional information so I can set up a Zoom call with Jesus and the Holy Spirit and we can reach a final decision. He says, go check out this land that I'm giving to you. And that's a big deal. So Moses picks 12 guys. They go into Canaan. They spy and explore for about 40 days, and they come back. And Moses had told them, look, see if you can bring back some fruit. Tell us what's going on. See if you can bring back some fruit to show uh, what this land can provide. And they do that. They come back, and they found some amazing fruit, and they present their report. They actually brought back a thing of grapes that was so heavy that one thing of grapes two dudes had to carry across their shoulders to show how amazing this land was. But they also discovered some things that had a lot of these spies a little worried. Look down at verses 27 through 31. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the Negev, the Hittites and Jebusites and Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, we should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. So what you see is these 12 spies go in to Canaan for 40 days, and they come back but they saw different things. Now, what's amazing about that is they didn't split up. They all went to the same places. They all experienced the same thing, but they saw different things when they came back. So you've got two of the spies, Caleb and Joseph, that are like, hey, Joshua's like, hey, we can take this land. This is beautiful. It's amazing. God has given us this gift. Let's go get it. But 10 of the spies, they focus on the negatives. They see obstacles in this land. They focused on the danger. They were scared to death by what they saw. And so what you've got is you've got two of the spies that are focused on the opportunity, the amazing things about this land and the, the power of God. You've got 10 spies that are focused on obstacles, and that's all they see. The spies said, look, we, we, can't, we can't attack these people. They're, they're more powerful than we are. And, and here's the truth. In a vacuum, what they said was exactly true. The Israelites were not more powerful than some of these groups that lived in this new land. But they had a secret weapon. They had the God of the universe on their side. And it's not just like a potential. They've seen God in action. The, the army in Egypt was way more powerful than Israel. But they got a front row seat to watch God destroy the entire army of Egypt without a sword being drawn. And so this is what they are seeing, and yet some of them saw only obstacles, not opportunities. And so Caleb and Joseph, they see the fruit, which represents the good in this land, the opportunity. And the difference in what they saw is what they were looking for. And really that's the first truth for us from this story, is so often what you see is impacted by what you're looking for. Let me give you an example. When Taylor and I are driving in a car and we drive by Chick-fil-A, we see different things. She sees a place where she can get a very healthy chicken wrap and great iced tea. I see long lines that stretch through the parking lot and out into the street. We're experiencing the exact same thing, and yet we see different things. What we're looking for, I'm looking to see how long the line is. She's thinking about chicken sandwiches and chicken wraps, and so we see different things. Two people can look at a glass of water that's at the halfway point. You've heard this a thousand times. Some people see a glass that's half empty, and some people see a glass that's half full. So let me ask you, 
when you experience some situation or a potential problem in life, do you see an opportunity or an obstacle? Because so often what you see is what you're looking for in that situation. And Jesus is such a beautiful illustration of this. You know, Jesus so often saw different things in a situation than everybody else saw. One time he was preaching to this crowd of way over 5,000 people, and it's getting towards dinner time, and the crowd's getting restless and hungry. And so the disciples, they go out and they find, the only food they find is one boy that has a sack lunch with two fish and five small loaves of bread. And they bring it to Jesus, but what they see in that is problems. They see obstacles. They see not enough food. They see a hangry crowd that's about to leave. And Jesus sees just the opposite. He sees an opportunity. He sees an opportunity for the glory of God to be revealed through a miracle. And and so he takes those two little fish and those five loaves of bread, and he begins to break it, and he gives thanks, and they pass it out. And it feeds everybody in the crowd. And in fact, they had 12 baskets full of food left over, more than they even started with. Jesus saw that situation completely differently than everyone else. Another time, Jesus goes to the tomb of his good friend Lazarus, who had been dead for about four days at this point, and everybody else at the tomb saw obstacles. They saw death and ending. Jesus saw hope and life in that moment. And so he performs a miracle, and Lazarus comes up out of the grave, and a new beginning starts. Jesus saw opportunity, not obstacles. So let me ask you, what do you see? When you look in the mirror, do you see somebody that's so broken and messed up that they can never be repaired? That's not what Jesus sees. Jesus sees you as beautiful. He sees all of the opportunity that's in your future through him. He sees you as a son or daughter of the king. See, this idea that what we see is so often what we're looking for really applies if you're married because that is a true reality of marriage. We so often see what we're looking for. In your marriage, if you're struggling, do you see opportunity for improvement or do you see obstacles to ever have a good relationship with your spouse? I heard a a marriage pastor who does a lot of seminars talk about the 80-20 rule uh, in seeing your spouse. He says that there's about 80% of your spouse that's awesome. It makes you happy. It brings you joy. It's why you fell in love with them. But there's about 20% of your spouse that just drives you nuts, makes you a little crazy. And it really comes down to what you focus on. Like if you think about your wife and you look at her from just the right angle, you can see some big old black hairs coming out of her nose. Guys, don't look at your wife. And women, if you're honest about your husband's feet, they smell a lot like moldy bread. And so when things are good, you're focused on the 80% that's awesome about your spouse. But when things get a little tough, boy, those feet really do start to stink. The person you fell in love with often is not that much different now. It's you're looking at different things. You're looking for the 20% now, not the 80%. And because that's what you're looking for, it's what you find. And if you're sitting there thinking that your marriage is a big old train wreck and your pastor doesn't know anything about what you're going through, he wouldn't be right about that. Lil and I, early in our marriage, we went through several years where things was Things were pretty miserable. We were very unhappy. She was not the girl of my dreams. And before you get all upset at me, I was not her Prince Charming either. We were unhappy. And, but we recovered. We began to look for opportunities and things began to get better. And so often, whether or not you're going to recover from that moment depends on whether you see obstacles or opportunities. I read the other day that 9 out of 10 couples that stay together for a lifetime went through a significant period where they were very unhappy. The difference in couples that stay together for a lifetime and those that don't is simply, what do you do in those moments? What are you looking for? Are you looking for a way to improve your marriage, for opportunities, or are you seeing only obstacles? University of Chicago sociologist Dr. Linda Wade and her team, several years ago, they conducted a study of 5,232 married adults. And of those surveyed, 645 initially reported that they were unhappy in their marriage. They said, oh, just miserable marriage. But they went back and talked to those same people five years later, and two-thirds of them now said 
they're happy in their marriage. Things changed over time. But they also looked at the people that got a divorce and didn't stay together for those five years. And what they found is that only one out of five of those people who got divorced, in other words, 20% who got divorced, would now rate themselves as happy. Not nearly as many as the people that stayed together. And even if you got divorced and remarried during that five-year period, you were just as likely to be unhappy in your second marriage as you were in your first marriage. The bottom line is that divorce is much less likely to make you happy than staying together and looking for opportunities in this difficult season. The question is, when it gets difficult, what are you looking for? Are you seeing obstacles or are you seeing opportunities? And maybe you're thinking, it's too late for my marriage. It's over. It's done. What's so awesome is we worship at Jesus and death wasn't too late for Jesus. And if he can bring himself back from the dead, if he can bring Lazarus back from the dead, then he can bring your marriage back from the dead. It's all about what you choose to do and what you choose to see. Jesus can absolutely breathe life back into your relationship. He sees hope in life where you see only disappointment and death. This issue of perspective, it also applies to how do you see the church? How do you see this church? Do you see church as a community that can help you grow and help you make your life better? Or do you just see it as a place you have to go a couple of times a month because you feel guilty or your wife makes you feel bad about it? How do you see it? And and if you see it as an obstacle, as just something you got to deal with, I've been there. (laughs) I've been right where you are. Some of you know my story. I was called to preach when I was a teenager, but instead I went to law school. And so I went to law school and became a lawyer. And every time I got close to God, I started feeling that call to preach. So my solution to that was just kind of keep my distance from God. And so looking for a church to really get connected in was not a priority for me. But it was for my wife. She wanted us to find a place where we could get connected, where our children could grow in their faith. And and so she'd come up with a new church every so often, and she'd be like, let's go try this one out. And so I'd go, and, you know, the preacher preached too long, or he didn't preach deep enough, or he didn't get us out in time to beat everybody else to lunch. The parking was a pain. The seats were too hard, or they were too soft. It was too hot, or it was too cold. The music was too old or too new. I was essentially the Goldilocks of church hoppers. And so two or three times, and I'd be like, no, not this one. My wife would find another one a few weeks later, and we'd go try that one out, and I would find problems in that one too. And eventually, I got to the place where I decided I've got to repair my relationship with God. I've got to fix my relationship with my wife and my kids. And as I began to do that, my perspective changed. So the first church that we went to after we, I made that change in perspective, I fell in love with. I, I loved everything about it. And so we got connected. Uh, We started serving. We got in a a community group. We started a new ministry at that church. Eventually, I became an elder, and I watched as my relationship with God got better. My relationship with my wife and my kids got better. And we loved it, loved everything about it. And eventually, because I'd gotten close to God again, I felt the call to preach, and I submitted to preach. And, And as I look back about that one church versus the 15, 20, 30, whatever it was that we visited over those years, you know what was different? Me. (laughs) Those churches weren't that different. I had a different perspective. (coughs) Before, I was looking for obstacles to going to church, and man, that's exactly what I found. But when I began to look for opportunities, that's what I saw. And maybe you're like I was, and you're still looking for obstacles of why you can't get connected. Are you just coming to worship service every so often because you kind of have to, but then you leave and you're a little disappointed that you're not making connections and you're not growing closer to people? Perspective, that's what's impacting it. You know, so often when people leave a church, it's because they never really got connected. And in the churches I've been in ministry in, when people do that, I'll ask them, so you don't feel connected, were you in a community group? No. Did you serve in missions? No. Did you do anything outside coming to church two or three times a month? No, you know, we were so busy with the, with the kids and with work, we just never got around to it. And I think, well, there's your problem. They were finding obstacles to keep them from being involved in church, 
not opportunities to grow deeper in their relationship with Jesus and to find a church family that would help them grow and support them. So what are you looking for here at church? Maybe some of you need to be looking for a relationship with Jesus for the first time. But when we have invitation after the sermon, what you see is obstacles. It would be getting out of your comfort zone to come back there and visit with me or Chris. You see obstacles, taking a chance. Maybe things are going to differ. Maybe your relationship with other people is going to change. And so you focus on the obstacles to following Jesus rather than the opportunity to have your life changed and your eternal destination changed. It's all about perspective. This same thing applies to your work. It applies to relationships with your parents and your kids, your relationships with other people. What you're looking for is so often what you find. So if you're looking for the best in your job, you're going to find it to be a better place to work. If you're looking to all the obstacles to have a good employment, you're going to struggle. You're going to find exactly what you're going to look for. If you're working to make relationships better and see the potential for improvement, you're going to have relationships grow and deepen. But if you're looking for obstacles, that's so often what you're going to find. What you see is so often impacted by what you're looking for. All right, look back at our story. The spies start telling, they come back and they start telling the Israelites about what they found. So you got Caleb and Joshua telling people, and it's awesome. We got to go take this place. This is our home. But the other 10 spies... They're focusing on the negative, and they're talking about all the negative. And in fact, at this point in time, when they're telling people, they start to pass out a little fake news. They start, start kind of making some stuff up. Let's look at that. This is Numbers 13, 31 through 14, 1. But the men who had gone up with him said, he's talking about Caleb here, we can't attack these people. They're stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report. So this is fake news about the land they had explored. They said, the land we explored devours those who live in it. All the people we saw there were of great size. We saw the Nephilim there. The descendants of Anak come from the Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. That night, all the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. So you've got these spies. They're now trying to justify why they're scared to go in. So they're making up some things. And they, they make up three things here that they say. The first thing they say is, oh, my goodness, the land destroys the people that live there. Well, that's not true. They didn't see that. They saw people just living life. The second thing they see is that everyone was bigger than we are. Well, that's not true. Some of the people were bigger than they were, but certainly not all of them. And then the last thing is my favorite. They say, we look like grasshoppers in the eyes of the people we saw. Well, they didn't even talk to those people. They were spying. They were slipping around and checking things out. And they've now decided that they look like insects to the people who live there. They're making up fake news about this. And because of that, negativity starts to spread through the whole camp. Fear becomes addictive in the people. The Israelites chose to listen to the ten spies that were focusing only on the negative and not the two spies who saw the opportunities. And who they listened to impacted what they began to see, which leads us to the second truth in this story. What you see is impacted by who you listen to. If you spend all of your time listening to a particular person or to a particular point of view, it is absolutely going to dominate your thought process. It's going to affect how you see the world, how you view the people around you, how you view the church, how you view our government is going to be impacted by who you listen to. Because the reality is, it affects us. And here's what's amazing to me about how the news media has changed just in my lifetime. When I was a kid and you watched the news, they were mainly just giving you facts about a situation. You could flip from the three channels we had when I was a kid, and the news was basically the same. And they were giving you facts, and they would let you form opinions based on those facts. But over time, the news began to give us opinions, and then they selected facts to support those opinions. They might even make up a little fake news to support those opinions. But now it's even worse than that. If you go to foxnews.com and cnn.com, they're not even telling the same stories. Has anybody else noticed that? Yeah, you can go to foxnews.com and there's a headline story. And then you flip over to cnn.com, you can't even find it. And if you do find it, you've got to scroll all the way down. Same thing, CNN, you see a headline story. It's not even on Fox News. 
they're not even telling us the same story because they're trying to influence what we think about the world. CNN is trying to convince us that conservatives are destroying this country. Foxnews.com is trying to just convince us that liberals are evil and godless. And if you spend all your time watching one or the other, or listening to one or the other, or reading one or the other, it will absolutely convince you that your view of the world is right. And you will begin to see things as you expect to see them. Who you listen to will absolutely ha- affect how you see yourself, how you see God, how you see church, how you see our country. I, I told you about this a few months ago. But it amazes me that so many Christians left their faith when they read the Da Vinci Code book by Dan Brown. It's a fiction book. It's not true. But they would read this story that talks in a kind of a historical feeling narrative about Jesus not being divine and having a wife and having descendants. And they walked away from their faith based on this story. If you want to find the Da Vinci Code on Amazon or if you go to a bookstore, I don't know if those even exist, I don't know. But if they do, and you go to look for the Da Vinci Code, where do you go to look for that? The fiction section. Why? Because it's not fact. It's fiction. And yet, that fictional story impacted the way people view God. It's just a, it shows us that what we listen to, what we consume, impacts what we see. That's why it's so important for you and your family to be in church on Sundays. Why, why it's so important for you to get involved in a community group and study the Bible. Why it's important for you to study the Bible on your own. Because you are absolutely impacted by what you consume. Who you listen to absolutely affects what you see. And so that's important for all of us. So we need to consume more things that remind us of the beauty of God, the strength of God, the power of God. Rather than things that distort our image of God and distract us from living a beautiful life filled with love and holiness, and service. Listen to how the Bible says this in Philippians 4, 8. It says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Paul is telling us, focus on voices, focus on news, focus on things that are beautiful and right and noble and good. That's why it's so important that you regulate the music that your kids listen to, that you make sure you know what TV shows and internet programs they're watching, that you're aware of the video games they're playing, because who they listen to will absolutely affect who they, what they see, and the same is true for you. Who you listen to will absolutely affect what you see. Look at what comes next in Numbers 14, 2 through 4. The Israelites hear all these crazy stories from the ten spies about these massive giants in the promised land. And they weep and they wail. But look at what they do next. They're going to grumble. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron. And the whole assembly said to them, If only we had died in Egypt or in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to one another, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. They have a leader. God gave them a leader in Moses, but they want to choose somebody different. And they start grumbling and focusing on the negative. They had seen all of the amazing things that God had done for them. But they start complaining and they criticize Moses and Aaron. And their complaints, their speech begins to breathe life into the negative perspective that they have. Joshua and Caleb, they try to change the people's perspective. Look at verses 6 through 9. It says this. Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had explored the land, they tore their clothes, so they're angry and they're upset. And they said to the entire assembly, the land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and and he will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not be afraid of the people of the land, because we will devour them. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. But the people, they didn't listen to Joshua, Caleb. They listened to the other ten spies. And then they begin to complain and talk about all of the negatives. And the things they say breathe life into their fear and their worry. And that brings us to the final truth from this story. What you you see is impacted by what you say. What you say begins to influence how you see yourself, 
how you see God, how you see your family and the world around you. I've heard it said this way, your words create worlds. In other words, the way you describe an experience begins to become the experience. When I went, was 17 years old, I went to Europe with a bunch of other kids, and we went all over for 21 days in this big bus, had a great time, but that was before cell phones had uh, cameras in them. It was really before cell phones were a thing, and so I didn't have that, and because I was a 17-year-old boy, I didn't even think to take a camera. So I have like six pictures from that whole trip, and three of those are us in, a, in, in the hotel room playing cards. Don't know why I thought that was the most important things to bring back, but I did. So now... I don't remember a whole lot about this, that trip, but what I do remember is the stories we've told. The, the, the memories I have from that trip is when my buddies and I, we sit down and we talk about that trip when we were kids and we describe things. That's become my experience. And I'm sure over the last, I don't know, 35 years, the stories have changed a little bit. We've not remembered. And so the way we tell a story has now impacted the way I remember the trip. So I'm, I'm sure I misremember some things about that trip based on the stories we've told. The words we say have become my experience. Our words have an amazing impact on us. Did you know that the words we say can actually affect physical pain that we feel? There was a 2019 study in a medical journal called Brain and Behavior that determined that the way we describe our pain to doctors and to other people actually affects the way our brain feels the intensity of pain. And so if we describe our pain as severe, we're more likely to experience severe pain. If we describe our pain as a, you know, 2 out of 10, we're more likely to experience pain as a 2 out of 10. Let me give you another example that's pretty cool. So we're going to fix and play an audio clip. Some of you may have heard this. We're going to put it up, and we're going to play an audio clip, and the words you think about are going to be the words you hear. So the first time it plays, I want you to think about the phrase, brainstorm. So as you're listening to this audio clip, we'll put it on the screen for you. Think about the words brainstorm and see what you hear. Did you hear brainstorm? Listen again. Okay. This next time, I want you to think about the words green needle. Think about the words green needle. We're going to put it on the screen. See what you hear. Did you hear green needle? That is the exact same audio clip. What you're thinking about affects how you hear it. Now, I want to do something different this last time. I want this side of the room to think about brainstorm and this side to think about green needle. All right? Brainstorm, green needle. See what you hear. What'd you hear? Brainstorm? Did you, what'd you hear? Green needle. So you hear what you're expecting. Words have an incredible power on us. Pretty crazy, right? If the words we say can impact the way we feel pain and the way we hear an audio clip, just imagine the words that we think about and we say, how it affects our view of the world, how it affects our view of our lives and the opportunities and obstacles around us. So are you speaking words of hope and faith and love? Or are you speaking words of despair and negativity and worry and fear? The words we say are so incredibly powerful. They influence the way we see the world. And so we need to speak words of hope and love and joy because those things take root. They begin to change our hearts and they begin to give life to those things. But see, if we're constantly fussing about problems that we're experiencing and we're always gossiping about the things we don't like about other people... As we look at the world around us, we're going to see more and more obstacles, more and more difficulty, more and more problems. What you see is impacted by what you say. As a result of the Israelites choosing to see obstacles in the promised land rather than opportunity, God lets them go back into the desert. And they would spend about 38 more years wandering around in the desert because of their negativity. God allowed the entire generation who was negative about the the promised land, die off. The only two people from that generation that actually got to go into the promised land were Caleb and Joshua, the two spies that saw this land through the lens of God's promise. 
They missed out on this amazing opportunity for 38 years because they focused on the obstacles and not the opportunities. What do you see in the world around you? Obstacles or opportunities? When you think about making a difference in the world or sharing your faith or trying to change people's lives for the better, do you focus on your own lack of ability, your own weakness, or or do you focus on the amazing power of God? It all comes down to perspective. Some of you guys may have heard of a man named Nick Vujicic. Nick Vujicic has this genetic disorder that causes him to have no arms or legs. He was born without arms or legs. Here's a picture of Nick. And you can imagine the obstacles that he faced to have a normal life. And as a kid, he struggled with depression. When he was an early teen, he actually tried to commit suicide by just falling over into a pool. But somebody rescued him. And eventually he became became a Christian. And his perspective began to change. Nick is now married. He has four kids. The dude plays golf. He swims. (laughs) He snow skis. He surfs. He can type 43 minute words per minute on a computer with no arms and legs. I can't stick with that. He's now an evangelist. He's one of the most sought after motivational speakers in the world. He travels all around the world encouraging people. He signs hundreds and thousands of autographs by using his mouth. He's authored a book. His life has been filled with success and he's impacted positively thousands and thousands of people. His physical limitations haven't changed. He he doesn't have arms or legs then and he doesn't have arms or legs now. What changed is his perspective. But that change in perspective completely transformed his life. And now he has a life of amazing success and is an inspiration to millions of people. I, I love that on his personal website, he has this phrase at the very top. Obstacles equal opportunities. So what do you see when you look at yourself and the world around you? Obstacles or opportunities? Don't let what you think is possible keep you from experiencing what God has promised. Let's pray.